Hi, I'm Richard Morai, Senior Minister at Unity of Phoenix Spiritual Center, and I want to thank you for visiting our website and for tuning in to today's message. If you feel inspired by today's talk, I really encourage you to make a donation by hitting that button below and making a contribution to this ministry. It'll allow us to continue these messages online and to do the great work we do here at Unity of Phoenix, which is to inspire people to live better lives. So thanks for tuning in, thanks for your support, and we hope to see you at a Sunday real soon. Okay, today we're talking about stories. How many of you have a story? How many people do you have that won't listen to your story? See, one, one of the interesting things about stories is that our soul seems to need to tell stories. And I don't want to change that. I don't want to change, but I do want you to check your stories. Because I really want you to see, is the story that you're telling yourself does it inspire you or overwhelm you? Does it cause you to believe or to go into doubt? Does it cause you to try or to give up? See, not all stories are equal. And some of the most powerful stories we have are the stories that were the most difficult moments in your life. Because in those most difficult moments, you felt the presence of God guiding you, directing you, moving you beyond where you were to where you could be. You know, as we tell our stories, it inspires us to really look at what we believe is the nature of life. Do we believe that life is good? Or do we believe that somehow we're being punished? And our stories at their very core share our essence and our understanding of the way life is. So when you tell yourself the stories about your own life, are they inspiring you to live a greater life? Are they challenging you to do more than you've ever done before? Or are they causing you to pull back and to hide and not to believe? And over and over again, what I want you to be, really begin to look at and take responsibility for is the stories you tell yourself, the stories you tell in your family and in your world that we need to be inspiring each other in the stories that we tell. You know, one of the things that I think is amazing in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is that we hear the stories that they would tell themselves over and over again, especially when the people were in a time of difficulty or they were in a jam or there was a problem. They would tell the stories of their people over and over again to inspire them, to really say, if God was with us then, if God made things happen then, then God will be with us now. And that's really in the ideal world, that's what stories do. They give us the faith to keep on even when we're not sure how. The Israelites would tell the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and how God was with them and how God delivered them and set them free. They would tell the story of Moses and the promised land and how he set them free from Egyptians and they wandered in the wilderness and God provided for them how he brought him into the promised land, and then they would tell the stories of David and the prophets. And the idea over and over again is your stories need to lift you higher. They need to call you to a higher level of good. That if we're telling the same old stories over and over again, and every time they depress you, it is time to write a new story for your life. It is time to tell a new story of a new possibility for who God created you to be because God did not create you to be victimized by life but to overcome it. So today we celebrate the 20th anniversary of coming to this campus. And in many ways it was a story of impossibilities. It was a story uh, that should never have happened and yet it did. It was a story of a small group of people who believed that there should always be room for one more person. Richard wanted me to tell the story of what it was like from my point of view of coming to this ministry in the early 90s. And at the time, there were a few hundred people, and we did two services, 9 and 11. And in those two services, we had just a couple hundred people. And in a very short amount of time, we grew from a couple hundred to over a thousand people. And we were doing four services. We did a Saturday night and three Sunday mornings, just in case it completely wiped out my whole weekend. 
<laughs> and the problem was in that little church, it could only sit 300 in the sanctuary. And if we put chairs in the foyer, we could get up to 400 and it would be packed. But it would be packed from the second and the third service. It was packed. Not only, and we had less than three acres. Now we have almost 19 we had three acres, and so what would happen is, is if you could find a place to park, you got to come to church, <laughs> right? And so people would drive around the campus and drive around the campus hoping they could find it. And, and many times people would drive two, three times around the parking lot, and then they'd leave and they'd go home because they couldn't find a place to park. Or they'd park illegally down 15th Avenue, and for about a mile down 15th Avenue, they would park illegally, I, not that I knew that at the time. But, and then they'd park in the neighborhoods. And then it got to the point where we couldn't add one more service. And we couldn't figure out how to get more cars in the parking lot. So it was time to build a new church. And so we began to look at, was there a building or another church that we could buy? The church that we had at 15th Avenue Norman, Nor Northern used to be a Royal Palms Baptist church until they moved and so we bought their church. So our first thought was, is there another church that we could find? And we looked at a, a church on Central, and we began to meet with their board. Their, their church had dwindled, and they were ready to sell their large building. And we met with them several times. And the more we met with them and we shared our vision, when we shared what God was doing in our ministry, the more they got inspired. And at the last meeting, they said, you know, we're so inspired by what God's doing in your ministry. We're not going to sell our church. And it's like... And that wasn't the plan. <laughs> like, God wanted you to move. <laughs> it was time, right? And they didn't, they didn't think it was time. Now, they were all so inspired, they wanted to go after it again. We looked at the Jew, old Jewish community center. We looked at, uh, well, we looked at everything. If it was a bowling alley, <laughs> it could have been a church. I mean, we literally looked at everything. And then we started, when we realized we, that wasn't going to happen, it wasn't God's way, I had a dream one night, and, got, and in the dream it was, no, you're responsible for every brick, every block. So we began to look at property, and we looked at here, we looked at a piece of property on 19th Avenue, and we looked at a piece of property on 40th Street. And the congregation voted, and the congregation picked this. We had 16 acres at the time. And when going from three acres, less than three acres, to 16 acres, felt like we had a huge canvas to create a ministry on. And it was $1.6 million for that 16 acres. Doesn't seem like a lot now, but it was a huge sum of money for us. And the architect had told us that it was going to be about $2.5, $2.4 million to build this campus. So that meant the whole deal was going to be about $4 million. And we had never raised a million dollars in one year, and we were looking at a $4 million deal. It seemed huge. And at the time, there were people that suggested that we could do bake sales. <laughs> we calculated how many years it would take, <laughs> and we'd still be doing bake sales. So we had this deal, $4 million it was going to take, and we began to in be interested how we could create that kind of money. What would we have to do? How much could we borrow? How much could we beg? Even sometimes it felt, how much could we steal? In a spiritual context, of course. <laughs> right? And so we began to work toward making this dream a reality. And then a church came to us and said, we want to buy your campus, your Northern and 15th Avenue campus, and we will give you the money now, and we will give you one year to build your church. We want your campus so much. We want Northern 15th Avenue so much that we will give you this $800,000, $650,000 now, and the clock would start. We had worked out a deal with a bank for a construction loan that they had told us would become a, a mortgage they had expectations of how much money we still had to raise. They had expectations about how much money we had to bring in every year as revenue into the church. And we could do it. It was close. It was tight. But it was possible. It was possible. We could do it. If everything went exactly the way it was supposed to go. Have you ever been in one of those situations? 
If everything went exactly the way it was supposed to go, we could put this deal together. So with the vote of the congregation, with the approval of the board, we decided to sell our church. And the moment we sold it, the, more we, the moment we signed the dotted line, the clock started and we had one year. We had to the end of 1998 to build and move because if we didn't, we were going to lose everything. So we took the money that they gave us. We bought half of this property. The, the lender, the, the owner of the property would lend us on the other half. That's why people say, well, why did you build in the center? Why didn't you build on, on, on Greenway? Well, we hadn't paid for Greenway yet. They weren't very excited to let us go on a piece of property we hadn't paid for yet. They said, you can build on this half. When you pay for that half, you can build on that half. So we went. We started. And it was, it was a completely an act of faith and an act of insanity. Because we had put everything on the table. We had risked our entire ministry. That if this deal didn't come together, we would have a beautiful eight acres of desert <laughs> and no church home. And the clock started. Before that clock started, I had no gray hairs. <laughs> the clock started. And, and we began to enroll people even more in, in building this dream. We had this dream that there would be a, a congregation and a community and a church that would be big enough for all of us. So people wouldn't have to walk out because they couldn't find a parking space or they couldn't find a place to sit. That we'd had space for everybody and we began to work. Somebody who donated, is Jeanette here? Jeanette, are you in the house? Jeanette's husband. Jeanette was, was the one on the staff. Jeanette's husband donated his beautiful fully restored 1967 Mustang Fastback. Anybody remember that car? He donated that car so that we could do a raffle. And we raffled the heck out of that car. <laughs> we sold so many raffle tickets. I mean, we were doing everything. We raffled that car off. And the day we raffled it off, the person that won it gave it back to the church. And we raffled it again. <laughs> we did. <laughs> And I think we raised more the second time. We raffled it harder the second time. And we were talking to people. We, you know, sometimes say, I don't want my minister talking to me about money. We were talking to folks about money pretty much every week. Because if we were going to do this deal, we had to be straight up. This is a $4 million deal. The bank would only lend us so much money. If we were going to put this deal together, it had to be all of us. And there was amazing souls that loved this ministry so much, were so dedicated to this place, wanted to believe that we could have a ministry that was big enough for all those people that wanted to come, that people gave, and they gave generously. Some people gave in incredible ways to allow us to be here. And yet over and over again, there was one obstacle after another that we had to overcome. And sometimes it looks like, oh, this is the deal breaker. This is the thing that's not going to work. What, I want you to look up. Do you see the ceiling? It's purple. Well, when, when the architect designed it, every one of those structures was a different color. So when we finally got in here, the, the air conditioning ductwork was, was uh, silver. The ceiling was yellow. The trusses were black. Some of the, the speakers were, were gray. It looked like your worst grocery store you've ever seen. <laughs> it did, right? And so our big idea is that we were going to just paint the whole thing one color, purple, so it would just go away. And our sound guy, our sound architect that was designing the sound system said, you have four huge walls. He said, we know that, four huge walls, got it. He said, sound bounces off walls creates echoes. It can be problematic. He said the, the floor, the carpet, and the chairs, and the people will absorb some of it, but in the ceiling, the way it's designed, there are little holes in the ceiling, and those little holes are to gather up sound so that it doesn't bounce off the ceiling too. He said, I can't guarantee if you paint that ceiling, you're not going to lose all of its properties. It's not designed to be painted over. You could block the holes. So we had to pray about it. Do we go with just the way it was designed? 
Or do we paint it? And we decided to paint it. That it had to be done. And we prayed about it. We prayed about it. We prayed about it some more. And when we painted it, a few days later, the sound guy came back. And I don't know how he did it, but he tested the ceiling in it. And it still worked. It still absorbed the sound the way it was supposed to. And then when we were building the garden, um, it, it was kind of designed to be flat. But we also wanted to put water in it. And water in a flat garden doesn't run very well. <laughs> right? It just it doesn't move down the path like it does in our garden. So we built it up. And, and we didn't, apparently we built it up higher than it was designed to be because you know, if some, are, if some is good around here, too much is just about right, right? So we built it up. And then the man that was helping us with uh, kind of manage the project for us, Jerry Kodansky, said, you built it too high. That wall's not going to hold it. The retaining wall that we built around the garden, he said, it's, it's too much dirt. It's too much trees. It's not going to hold. And, and we said, no, it'll be fine. Well, the wall started to slide. I mean, almost instantly. And he said, look, it's going to fall over. And so he said, what we're going to do is we're going to put another ret a retaining wall on the retaining wall. And he said, this will give you enough weight, enough strength, and we're going to dig six-foot footers. So it's going to actually hold that in place, and it worked. And then we got to the bookstore and realized we would forgot to design any fixtures in our big bookstore. It's like, I don't know what happened. We just didn't do it. You know, in our old church at, 19, at 15th Avenue in Northern, we had, a, we had like three book racks. If we would have put three book racks in our bookstore, it would have looked like nothing. So I called my father-in-law and said, I need help. I need you to build us all the equipment we need for our bookstore. And he gave us three weeks of his life. He came over and lived with us. And he built... Everything in our bookstore, all the counters, all the displays, he built them so that we could open the bookstore on time. And it was like that over and over again. Whatever the hurdle was, whatever the obstacle was, whatever the thing that we were sure was going to break the deal, God gave us a way around it. God gave us a path. And that over and over again, God gave us a way. And it was all through a lot of people that really loved unity so much, were so dedicated to seeing this project work, that over and over again they would step up in ways that seemed unimaginable. But they did it and they wanted to do it because they believed that we could create a community that was big enough for everybody who wanted to come. And the clock kept ticking. And then we moved in on Thanksgiving morning, our first service. We got conditional use permit from the city to move in. And on the first service, Thanksgiving morning, we moved in. I was in my office. And about, nine, about 10 minutes to 10, when the service was supposed to start, as far as the eye could see, there were cars on Greenway trying to turn in to be at the service. We actually had to hold the service off for 10 minutes to give people time to get in. And there were so many people here. In fact, one of the ladies I talked to at the last service, there were so many people that every seat was filled. There were people sitting on the stage. There were people five deep all the way around the room because so many people were invested in this dream. It was one of the most powerful moments of my life to watch a group of people with one dream, one vision, one possibility, totally dedicated to whatever it took to make it happen. And we did that first service. And both the songs that Sally Joe sings today, we did at that very first service. And thanks for Sally Joe for bringing those songs back. They were, they're powerful, they're powerful service songs. And the question that I have for you, the thought that I have for you, the desire that I have for you, is when you see this piano, does it look real? Does it look real? It looks real, doesn't it? Right? When you look at these walls, these block walls, they look real, don't they? They look substantial, don't they? 
They look like they're going to be here for a while, don't they? What I want you to see is that this is still a dream. It's still a dream. That the only thing that keeps this place solid and real and functioning is because people still believe in the dream. You know, I know of three Unity churches this year that have closed. I know another large Unity church that had to move from their beautiful campus to a much smaller place because they didn't have, it wasn't working anymore. That one of the things that happens when we're given a gift is sometimes we don't always appreciate what we've been given. But this is a dream. And the way that this dream is here, not only now, but for the next 20 years and the 20 years after that, is if each one of us actually buys into the dream. If we believe that it's valuable enough, that we're committed enough to make this dream a reality for those that will come after us, because somebody cared enough to buy the seat that you're sitting in. They paid for it. They worked for it. They sweat for it. And now every week, we enjoy it because somebody loved us enough. Even though they will never meet us, they loved us enough to buy it for us, for our family, for our kids, for our grandkids. It's been paid for, for us. And tonight, as we, today as we celebrate this ministry, I want to challenge you. I do. I want to challenge you to relook at your commitment to the dream of this place. And it never take it for granted. That this place was, the doors were open when you needed this place the most. And this place was here for you. It's fed your soul because somebody else paid for it. And over and over again, I want us to make sure that it's here for another 20 years. When I'm 110, I want to be able to tell the story of this place because generation after generation, we believed that this place was worth it. And we wanted to do our part to keep that dream alive. Will you pray with me? I invite you to open your mind, your heart, your soul to the activity of God that moves in and through this ministry every week. That every week we are being blessed by the activity of God, the God that walks with us and guides us and directs us and provides everything that we want, everything that we need. Thank you, God. And thank you, God, for every soul of light that believed so much in this place, they dedicated their heart and their soul to making sure that it was bigger and better than it's ever been before that we tell the story of this ministry because God did an amazing thing. And that gift that we were given, we don't want to take it for granted. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for all that we are, for all that we have, for all the way that this ministry has blessed people over the last 20 years. God, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Together, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. One more time. We say thank you, thank you, thank you. One more time. We say thank you, thank you, thank you. And so it is. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Happy Thanksgiving.